Hello and welcome to Geology Concepts. Today we are going to discuss the first part of the current affairs from month of October where we will be dis uh, discussing topics mostly from polity and governance, international relations and Indian economics. And uh, without any further ado, let's get started. So the first update is on appointment of Chief Justice of India. So Chief Justice of India, the uh, former Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrachur, retired uh, on uh, November 10th of 2024 and recommended Justice Sanjeev Khanna as his successor, who will become the 51st Chief Justice of India uh, in the upcoming year, right? So the process of Chief Justice of India appointment is something that is important for our exam. The, uh, uh, there are certain principles that are followed before appointing the Chief Justice of India. The first principle is seniority principle. That means the appointment of the CJI is typically based on the senior most judge of the Supreme Court. So the senior most, most judge of the Supreme Court is generally on principle appointed for the uh, CJI post. And then there is another principle called memorandum of procedure where the law ministry, the ministry of law will request a recommendation from the outgoing CJI to uh, name name one of his or her uh, successor, right? And then uh, after the recommendation, the presidential president gives appointment. That means after receiving the appointment, president of uh, India will appoint the CJI, right? Now the tenure and retirement procedure is something like that. That CJI serves until reaching the age of 65. So until he reaches the age of 65, he can serve, and the process repeats after the CJI's retirement, right? And uh, the criteria for uh, um, appointing the CJI along with seniority is some um, is called merit and integrity, which is mentioned in the constitution. That means he should be he or she sh uh, should be of particular merit and integrity, and th these are uh, some of the important factors before appointing the Chief Justice of India. So, if you see the appointment of judges of Supreme Court, then judges of the Supreme Court are also appointed by the President. The Chief Justice is appointed by the President. Also, this uh, uh, Supreme Court judges are appointed by the President. But the, when, when you are uh, appointing the Chief Justice, so, uh, the President consults with the Collegium, right? So, Collegium consists of senior Supreme Court judges. And after the uh, appointment of the Chief Justice of India, then uh, President uh, consults with the CGI for appointing other judges of the Supreme Court. And the consultation with the Chief Justice is obligatory in case of appointment of the judges other than the Chief Justice himself, right? So that's all that you need to understand as far as the exam is concerned about the appointment of Chief Justice of India, right? Now the next uh, um, uh, update is on the ESRAM portal, which was launched by uh, Union uh, Union uh, Minister, Minister Dr. Manshuk Mand uh, Mandavia, uh, which will be a one-stop solution platform for designing and streamlining access to various social security and welfare schemes for unorganized workers in India. So. Remember this, this is not for the organized workers, this is something which is uh, specifically designed for the unorganized sector of India, right? Now let's talk about its origin. So it was first launched in August 26th of 2021 to provide a comprehensive database of the unorganized workforce in India and will also serve as a platform for accessing welfare schemes that are uh, promoted by the government for these unorganized sectors, right? And it aims to act as one-stop solution for the organized workers, which will integrate their information and also facilitate easy access to social security and welfare schemes, right? Who will be the nodal ministry? So Ministry of Labor and Employment will act as a nodal ministry for the implementation of the ESRAM portal, right? Uh, if you see the features, it integrates 12 central scheme to ensure unorganized workers get the benefits from, from multiple government initiatives, right? And the platform serves as a centralized database and also as a mediator to simplify the process of identifying the eligible workforce and also the also uh, uh, identifying the beneficiary for different schemes and initiatives by different governments, right? And if you see the that uh, uh, till 20, October 2024, over 30 crores of un unorganized workforce have registered on the platform. So we have data of almost 30 crore uh, Indian workforce who are working in the or unorganized sector on the ESRAM portal, right? And therefore, it has a large scale social impact, which will improve the awareness among the unorganized workforce regarding their uh, regarding their uh, um, uh, schemes that are designed for them, contributing for their betterment, and will also cover uh, um, help in cover and support uh, this vulnerable sector of the Indian workforce, right? So that is all about the ESRAM portal. 
नेक्स्ट लेट्स टॉक अबाउट द इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन सो करेंटली दिस एक्सटेंड ब्रिक समिट वॉज हेल्ड एंड आफ्टर द कम्पलीशन ऑफ द समिट द लीडर्स एडोप्टेड द काज एंड डिक्लेरेशन विच विच वॉज हेल्ड इन रशिया राइट सो द सिक्सटीन बिथ ब्रिक समिट इफ यू सी इट इज द सिक्सटीन वर्जन ऑफ द ब्रिक समिट एंड वॉज होस्टेड बाई रशिया इन काजान and it was held during 2020 uh, 2020 october uh, 22nd october to 24th of the october for two days right and the theme was strengthening multilateralism multilateralism for just global development and security right who are the participants so the uh, brics countries were there so this uh, this year's big summit this 16th big summit was uh, important because the new partners of brics also joined the uh, summit right so the new partners were egypt ethiopia iran saudi arabia and ua right so the the important objective if you see of the 16 brics summit was that they want to discuss the economic corporate cooperation among the big countries multilateralism geopolitical concerns were also there and that to protect the interest of the global south right now let's uh, see what are the key areas that uh, the 16 brics summit focused on The first one is geopolitical concern of course Ukraine conflict in Gaza West Bank Lebanon conflict where um, have uh, taken the center stage in the discussion global governance and multilateralism was supported that means uh, um, it support the continued functioning of the G20 and a reformed and re- responsive global financial system was also been talked about economic cooperation was uh, given priority uh, um, and in that matter local currency promotion of the local currencies and cross border payments were also taken into account pandemic preparedness and health was also uh, uh, discussed that means agreement to explore establishment of brics crane exchange and brics cross cross border payment system was talked right and then brics r&d vaccine center and early warning systems were all uh, for the infectious disease was also talked about to support this kind of initiatives right and if you see the environmental conservation as- as- aspect india's big cat conservation initiative was uh, um, something that was uh the brics country agreed to support and uh in the future they are also uh, trying to expand their reach to other countries as well right so expansion and partnership was also been talked about in the kazan declaration so as far as the big summit was concerned you just need to remember what are the themes and where it is held right and who are the new countries that joined this initiative right next up the uh the update is on 5i alliance questions have been asked from 5i alliance as well in previous uh, cgsc papers so uk uh, um, re- uh, recently uk uh, showed its confidence in the judicial proceedings uh, by ottawa that is canada which is investigating the involvement of indian diplomats in 2023 killing of a pro kalistani preacher right so this is the update but we need to uh, know about 5i alliance right so the 5i alliance consists of members of five countries right so the five countries are australia canada new zealand uk and us right and the purpose of this uh, initiate uh, the alliance is that they want to uh, uh, share intelligence uh, uh, multilateral intelligence sharing net it is a multilateral uh, intelligence sharing network and primarily focused on surveillance and signal intelligence right and if you see the background of this alliance was from the uh, can be traced back to world war 2 right So World War II during uh, the uh, World War II they wanted to counter the Soviet threat and the Cold War so this alliance was made during that time so earlier in 1946 it was formed as a Brusa alliance or Brusa agreement that is Britain US agreement but later since Britain's name changed to UK so it came it, it is currently known as UK USA agreement and formalized the intelligence sharing partnership through this agreement right and then it was expanded to canada as canada joined in 1948 then new zealand and australia together joined in 1956 and it became a five nation alliance right so uh, it it covers six key areas which includes traffic analysis crypto analysis decryption and acquisition of communication related information so it is one of the uh, important um, uh, intelligence and security alliance in the world right next update is on a fil- uh, on a corridor called philadelphia corridor so israel uh, is demanding the uh, c- control of the philadelphia cor- corridor in uh, if if it wants to uh, as a uh, as a part of the condition for the ceasefire agreement between israel and hamas so israel is demanding a complete control on the philadelphia cor- corridor if there could be a a uh, ceasefire negotiation between Israel and Hamas so what is this philadelphia corridor it is nothing but a ribbon of land 
you can see this. This is the Philadelphia Corridor, corridor in the Gaza Strip. So this is a ribbon strip land, which is ab about 14 kilometers in length and 100 meters wide. And it, it is situated along Gaza's border with Egypt. So this is Egypt, this is Gaza. So some in between them, this Philadelphia Corridor is there, right? And there is, an, uh, there is a crossing or a uh, pass between this Philadelphia Corridor, which is called Rafa Cross. So it was designated as a demilitarized border zone after the withdrawal of the Israeli settlements and troops from Gaza in 2005. So after the uh, Gaza, uh, Gaza, uh, war, um, the um, Middle East war, uh, this demilitarized border zone or the Philadelphia Corridor was assigned and it runs from the Mediter Mediterranean Sea in the uh, uh, west to Kerem Salom crossing in the East to uh, with Israel, right? And after Israel withdrawal, it was uh, controlled by Egypt and Palestinian Authority. But now Israel is uh, demanding the control of the Philadelphia Corridor, right? Now let's talk about uh, updates from uh, economy section. So World Green Economy Forum 2024 was held in Dubai recently and uh, with a theme of empowering global action and unlocking opportunities and advancing progress. So it was uh, its aim was to promote global cooperation, innovation, sustainable practices across energy, decarbonization, climate finance and much more, right? The for this this forum's goal is to drive positive transformation towards net zero. So net zero is something that is the center of this particular forum, right? So the the features of the forum, if you see, there are many sessions on decarbonization in heavy industries. The focus also was on uh, future of this sustainable aviation fuel, which aims uh, for a 300 million tons of production of sustainable aviation fuel by 2050. Uh, promotion to public-private partnerships and. There are also panels on renewable energy, power grid challenges, and carbon footprint management as well. If you see this kind of forum is something that aligns with global climate goals such as the Paris Agreement, which increases the collaboration between governments, industries, and civil society for a sustainable development. Right? So it was held in Dubai this year. You need to also remember the theme. Now, uh, recently Nobel Prizes are also announced and 2024 20, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics was given to Daron Asmoglu, uh, Simon Johnson and James Rivenson for their research on wealth inequality between nations, right? Now, if you see that if, if their work, it, it, it focused on many things and one of them, their major theme was the study of the institutions. So they analyzed how the political and economic institutions shape a nation's prosperity as well as their development, right? It also analyzed the impact of colonialism. So they examined the system that are imposed by the European colonizers and their long-term effect on wealth inequality in different parts of the world and different parts of the society. Right? And for a uh, comparative analysis, they took uh, example of a city called Nicol uh, Nogales, which is uh, situated in between US and Mexico border. And they showed how different institutional framework lead to varying levels of prosperity on either side of the particular city. Right, towards the US side and towards the Mexico side, they took a, a comparative study analysis. Right, they also focused on democratic institutions, and all of their work was uh, published in a uh, co authored paper called Why Nations Fail. This is a book um, that was published by um, uh, Darren Asmaglu. So, he, uh, he and the uh, Simon and James Robinson they uh, published this book called Why Nations Fail, and that explored the economic disparity between nations and which focuses on different. Uh, areas from uh, for which this kind of uh, wealth inequality exists in different parts of the society, right? Next is a new index that is launched by World Bank called Be Ready Index or Business Ready Index, right? So as a new project, Be Ready is will be in a three-year rolled out phase. That is, uh, it will start from 2024 and will end in 2026, right? This, the current assessment includes 50 countries, but it does not include India for the time being. So it excludes India from this 50 country list, but it will be ex expanded to India by the end of it in 2026, right? This Be Ready uh, Index is particularly important because it replaces the earlier version of Ease of Doing Business of World Bank, which measured how easy it is to start, a, start and operate a business in a particular country. But in 2021, this particular index, that is the ease of doing business uh, index, was uh, uh, discontinued because of 
you have a lot of irregularities and also there are some ethical concerns with this kind of uh, rankings right so that's why from 2024 this new uh, initiative that is the be ready index will be ruled out in phased manner until 2026 so you need to understand who publishes it right and india is not a part of be ready index for the time being Another uh, um, index that uh, came in 2024 is the Global Innovation Index or GII 2024 edition which was jointly released by World Intellectual Property Organization or WIPO along with Cornell University and INSEAD Business School, right? The theme of this year's uh, uh, index is unlocking the promise of social entrepreneurship. So social entrepreneurship is something that was focused in this year's uh, or highlighted in this year's innovation index, right? Global innovation index. So what are the criteria that are uh, included for measuring different countries or ranking different countries? It is the uh, it is the kind of institutions that are there in the country, human capital development and research, infrastructure, credit facility, the kind of investment that are there in the uh, country, linkages, that means creation, absorption, diffusion of knowledge and the creative outputs of the workforce, right? So if you see the top countries, then Switzerland tops the chart with the first rank, then comes Sweden, then US and then Singapore. So these are the four countries that are top that top the rank of the Global Innovation Index 2024. If you see India, India ranked 39 among the 133 nations that were ranked, which and also it is an improvement of the previous position of 40th in 2023 edition, right? And if you see India holds the top rank between the lower middle income economies for the first thing and also in the central and south southern asian region right so in the low and middle income economies india holds the top position but overall it is 39th in the position and if you see cities bangalore delhi chennai and mumbai are among the top 100 science and technology clusters which were from india right so that's all that you need to remember as far as global innovation index 2024 edition is concerned and lastly Let's talk about a very important census that happens every five years, which is this year's 21st edition of Livestock Census, right? So this 21st edition of like uh, the Livestock Census was launched on October 25th, 2024 by Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairy, right? So as I said, it is conducted every five years. So the last census was conducted in 2019. And it was it, it was started in 1919. And uh, after that, in every five years, this is happening, right? And the schedule of the census period of this 21st livestock census will be from October 2024 to February 2025. Now, what all species are in, involved? So, it covers 15 livestock species, which includes cattle, buffalo, yak, sheep, goats, and much more, right? Also includes poultry species, and there are data on 219 indigenous breeds of 16 species, right? So indigenous breed is the something that uh, is something that is also counted in this kind of livestock census. And there are certain new features that are added in this uh, year's uh, census operation. The first census uh, took it will be the first census to capture the independent data on livestock holdings of pastoralists, right? So these are the nomadic pastoralists. Uh, so it will also include them. Previous uh, uh, census operations did not include the pastoralist, but this time pastoralist livestock holding will also be uh, included in the census operation. Then it will also provide information on the gender of the individual uh, individuals who are primarily involved in the livestock rearing. So if it is a male member or a female member of a family who is primarily involved in the livestock rearing, that will also be counted in the livestock census operation of this year, right? The technology also uh, was introduced uh, uh, um, in this kind in this uh, uh, part of the livestock census. That is, it will include the mobile technology for efficient data collection and transmission, right? And there will be around one lakh veterinarians and para veterinarians who will conduct the door-to-door -door survey of livestock census, right? And it is important because it provides critical data for our policy making and support livestock se sector's growth and development, along with identifying various beneficiaries from different parts of the society, right? So that's all for the first part of the month of October current affairs. I hope you have learned something useful from this video. I'll come up with the second part of the video very soon. Until then, keep revising and keep studying. Thank you again.